Good people of YouTube, my name is Spanner. Welcome back to some more Death Gates. Alright, we are in the control room of the Kixie Winzy. So we have a piece of ore, we need to put it in some kind of compartment of this digger, I believe. And it will dig a tunnel to where we need to go. So do I need to use the controls? The controls are many and varied, a compartment draws attention to itself, but the rest is a confusing mess. The bizarre object sits idle on the floor, it has a giant drill-like front end, you don't see any way to control it. Where is this compartment? Is it this slot? But it only mentions... ah! the comp Here's the compartment. You open the compartment, so let's put this in the compartment. As soon as you slip the piece of iron ore into the small compartment, its door slams shut. Lights flare and whistles blare all over the panel. Behind you, the giant digger machine chuffs. Its drill jerks into motion and starts to spin, gradually increasing speed. Puffs of steam toot and hiss randomly from holes, when the drill is no more than a blur. The whole machine trundles towards the wall and melts into it as if the wall were butter. Soon it disappears from sight, leaving a dark tunnel behind. Okay, there it goes. A tall statue of a sartan is surrounded by crystal caskets. A roughly hewn tunnel runs off to the west. You can see forms beneath the lids of the crystal coffins, but the faceting of the crystal blurs these forms. A statue of a robed sartan, much larger than life, lords over the room his hands outstretched as if asking for something. So, if I remember correctly, we need to place this crystal globe into the statue. Gingerly, you place the crystal globe in the pleading hands of the statue. As it clings into place, the statue's eyes alight with a blue fire. Shafts of the light pierce down through the globe. Internal facets distort the light as it passes through the crystal, so that when it has emerged from the other side, the light outlines a hexagonal shape on the ground. The ground shakes, the section of rock floor outlined by the blue light melts away, and Arianus's seal piece rises in its place. Suddenly, the crystal coffins open, revealing hundreds of Sartan all very dead. The entire experience is rather macabre. Take the air seal piece. Every one of the coffins is filled by a certain body. All of them are dead as doornails. Can I take the crystal globe? No, the globe has affixed itself to the statue's hands. You cannot remove it. Okay, so these Sartan are all dead. So I guess now we go back... to uh, Lord Tsar. I mean, actually, let me try something. If I'm correct, if this symbol is the symbol of Prion on this book, maybe I can use Rune Transfer. onto the steering stone. Nice! You transferred the Book of Prion onto the steering stone. 10 points. Okay, um... Okay, we have to go back to Nexus anyway.
Let's speak with Tsar and tell him of our adventures. So do we have to do this unification uh, thing in all the worlds? We did it in this one, the Book of Prien mentioned some more unification stuff. Maybe the uh, seal piece is only revealed to us once we do this. Hey there, Zar. Welcome back, my son. I see you've been successful. You have Arianus's seal piece. Congratulations. Now, please give me a report. You hand over the seal piece and describe your adventures on Arianus in detail. Most of the antics of the Mensch seem to bore Lord Zar, but he pays rapt attention to the discovery of the reference Book of Prian and of the crystal coffins holding the hundreds of Sartan corpses. Amazing. The only Sartan you find are long dead. I wonder if someone has stolen our vengeance from us, or if their consciences did them in. I will have to consider this new information. Now, was there anything else before you use your newfound book to go on to Priyan, Realm of Fire? Oh, it's actually pronounced Priyan. You know, Arianus was not a prison. The Mensch weren't slaves. Most of their problems were of their own making. Perhaps the Sartan knew what they were doing? Hmm, my son, of course, it may appear to be that way. Naturally, the Mensch weren't rebelling against the Sartan. According to your own report, the Sartan there are dead. Believe me, if the Sartan had been alive, they would have been grinding the Mensch under their heels. We are doing them a favor by removing the Sartan threat forever, or confirming its absence, and finally taking over the reins of their lives. The Sartan were right about one thing. The Mensch do need guidance. They're like children. Listen to your own report. Their squabbles are almost laughable. When we finally bring the world together, we shall give them the leadership that they so sorely need. Aren't we doing exactly what the Sartan were going to do? Hmm. What do you suppose killed the Sartan? They all looked fairly young. I'm not sure. Perhaps a plague, although I've never heard of a plague so selective that it wipes out an entire race and leaves others untouched. I don't think we have enough information yet. Hopefully you will learn more in your travels. Can you tell me anything about your research? The book I'm reading now is titled The History of the Sundering. Not only is it woefully inadequate, but it was improperly stored and moisture has damaged many of the pages. The book discusses the six Sartan responsible for the plan. Sama, Dimitri, Orsef, Lornoy, Tyler, and Weyleth. Each created a specific spell, and for reasons I won't go into, it is vital that I learn which spell each Sartan created. The book did have that information once, but the water destroyed it. So I've been forced to do quite a bit of research on each person. I've divined much about their personalities from other texts. I'm hoping that this will tell me what kind of spell they would be likely to create. I've become very familiar with each of them, and I've named them the Six Devils. Each is a devil in a unique way. He gives you a piercing look, as if to underscore how vital it is for you to understand the enemy. Tell me about Sama. I call Sama the Devil of the Soul. He was insidious. Although the Sartan Council was theoretically democratic, Sama could talk them into anything. In fact, there was much dissension on the Council when the plan was discussed. Many felt that it was too extreme, but Sama thundered right through the contrary arguments. The rest is history. What did you learn about Dimitri? I know Dimitri as the Devil of the Hand. He was very skilled at a variety of arts and was a talented musician. It said that his interests were very diverse, and he resented the time he was forced to spend on the council. Who is Orsef? Orsef is the devil of the heart. It is closest to the soul, and in truth, Orsef was Sama's closest advisor. He spent much time among the Mensch, studying them. The Mensch fascinated Orsef for some reason. It was he who was placed in charge of overseeing the transportation of the Mensch into the Four Realms. Can you tell me about Lornoy? 
I call Lornoi the Devil of the Eye. He was one of the few that saw the many problems with the plan. He was the leader of the pitiful opposition. I guess it shows how pitiful indeed the opposition was, that Lornoi was one of the instrumental participants in the plan. Sama must have talked swiftly to convince him. Tell me about Tyler. Tyler is the devil of the mind. He was the youngest and quickest of all six Sartan. If not for him, the plan might never have occurred. Although he was very ambitious, he wasn't nearly the politician that Sama was. Sama used him, as he used everyone to further his own plans. Who is this Waylith? I refer to Waylith as the Devil of the Tongue. Sama knew that Waylith was a skilled speaker and well-liked, perhaps almost as good a politician as he. He kept Waylith from the council for that very reason, and was fortunate that Waylith had no political aspirations. Otherwise, he might have had a fight on his hands. Can I take a look at that book? I'm afraid not. It's so damaged now that I have to keep special care of it. I never move it from this desk, and I turn the pages only with reluctance. I'm sorry. Let's go back to some other topic. Of course. What do you want to know? Can we talk about some of the subjects you touched on earlier? Of course. What do you want to know? Okay, Let's go nothing. Back to some other topic. Of course. What do you want to know? That's enough for right now. I'd like to talk to you later if you don't mind. Very well. I'll be here. Okay. Let's head back to the ship. And into Prian. World of Fire. I'm sorry, not Prian, Prian. Oh, I was expecting to see fire. Apparently not. Your ship arrives over a field of green, trees large enough to hold cities. One of them has a flat area just big enough to land the ship on. But something else has caught your eye. A glowing crystal city nestled in the carpet of vegetation. You decide to investigate and land the ship in the clearing nearby. Your ship sits on one of the only clear regions on Prion. To the west, a structure of mammoth proportions towers over you. Here's a pink plant. What is this? The plant isn't particularly interesting except for its bright pink flowers. Is it magical? Yeah, it's not magical. Okay, here's a path, trees... The trees of Prion are beautiful. From a distance they look normal, if somewhat lush. Closer inspection reveals that they are many times normal size. Some of them actually reach miles in height. Though the citadel appears to be one building, it is the size of a city. Crystal spires tower over the high wall which surrounds whatever lies within. Now I just remember, in Skurvash, that path in the alley we never figured out what it was. It had a line, so I assumed we could have gone there, but hmm, maybe not. Oh, hello. Oh, is this the citadel? Okay, if we follow the path, we're at the Citadel door. You stand outside the huge Sartan edifice. A wall surrounds it. There are no obvious doors, only the alcove to the south. The shallow recess has the shape of a staff, there's the one of a sword and the one of a hammer. These are probably the three amulets that we need to open the Citadel. One from the humans, one from the elves and one from the dwarves. It doesn't look like a door, it is more like a wall containing indentations of three different shapes. One resembles a hammer, another a sword, and the final one a staff. 
Okay, three, we can go in three directions, I believe. Okay, thick forest. Okay, down is to the citadel. That's the ship. And here's something. A strange animal, seated on the ground in front of a bush, startles at your entrance and leaps onto a branch. A tree grows in the middle of a patch of nut-bearing bushes. On a branch, an animal perches, watching you. The tree is small compared to its, gi compared to its gigantic neighbors. A branch, a little out of your reach, is occupied by a strange, nervous-looking animal. One of the nuts pulls away from its stalk rather easily, leaving behind a hole in the shell where the stalk was attached. So we have a nut. The nut is about the size of a human head. You see a hole where it pulled away from the stalk when you picked it. Inside you see that the nut is mostly hollow, except for a small amount of meat. The shell is incredibly hard, it feels like stone. And yet, there are a lot of shells here. I can take a shell. You sift through the pile of shells and finally select one that's to your liking. It's a half shell, harder and thicker than you would have imagined. The shape reminds you of a bowl, so you have a nut and a shell. A tree grows in the middle of a patch of nut-bearing bushes. On a branch, an animal perches, watching you. The animal most resembles a cross between a squirrel and a monkey, under a coat of thin fur. Sleek muscles move as it sways back and forth on its branch. You get the impression that it could prove quite formidable if provoked. I mean, it probably opened these, and they were quite hard, like stone, as we saw. Um, despite that there's nothing threatening about its manner, in fact, it seems to be alternating between wary curiosity and hunger. Its eyes travel back and forth between you and the bushes of nuts. Can I give you a nut? You toss the nut up to the animal perched on the branch. A lightning quick claw snatches the nut from the air. The animal tucks it close to his furry body and inserts two pointy talons into the hole in the shell. With a crack, the nut breaks open. Even from here, you can smell the explosion of a rich, nutty aroma coming from the exposed nut meat. The animal carefully sniffs the interior of the nut, then, when it appears satisfied, eats the meat in a few quick bites. It discards the shell onto a pile of like shells and settles back down on the branch to rest. Can I take another nut? I can. Okay, not sure what to do there now. Um, maybe later. Okay, down is the citadel. You stand at the edge of a thick forest, an old hollow tree stump sticks out of the ground. So there's forest, there's the stump, and I think I saw something else. No. Oh, branch. The stump has only one branch, and it is rather oddly shaped. It sticks out from the front at a curious angle. Can I take the branch? No, it's a pretty permanent part of the stump. The stump has been dead for a long time. Little holes in the wood show that it is hollow. One twisted branch sticks out at an odd angle from the front. Hmm. Let's go to the forest. The forest is unnaturally still. There are no sounds of birds or animals. There is no end, no, no wind. Oh, this is one of the titans. Hidden among the trees, you catch only fleeting glimpses of the giants. They look human, though with three, three major differences. They stand above 20 feet high, they lack hair, and they have no eyes. A uh, forest is thick and tall, allowing scant sunlight to break through. Something about it makes you uneasy. 
You could swear you see the trees move, but when you examine them closely, they remain still. Okay, are the titans going to kill me? You start to wander deeper into the forest when something very large, something you thought was a tree, moves threateningly towards you. You stumble backwards to where you started and the motion stops. Okay, so maybe we can't do anything here yet. Let's go back to the ship. Let's check out the other place we saw. Tree City. Giant trees support your ship over unseen ground far, far below. Foliage covers almost every surface, most of the plants resemble conventional bushes. The separate trees around you are actually just branches of the same huge tree that you stand on. Oh, here's a door. This is a clear flat area nestled amidst the branches of this giant tree. You see another tree over a narrow but deep drop. There's a clothesline. Can I pull it? You untie the thick clothesline and coil it up as you take it. Another giant tree stands very close to this one. You see a small garden in a niche, at approximately the same level as this clearing. It looks almost close enough to jump to, but not quite. A branch from the far tree extends over the chasm between the two trees, so maybe use the rope to jump across. Let's check this door. Oh, elves! Of course there are elves in the trees! The chamber appears natural, as if the wood of the tree grew with this space in mind. You step into the middle of a busy kitchen, but on your arrival all noise and, mo and movement suddenly cease. Three pairs of eyes lock onto you, two elven women halt their conversation and a child drops her broken doll and simply stares. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Haplo. Who are you? Why, I'm Cedra, head cook to the king. Greetings, Haplo. Now tell me, are you just some freeloader looking for a handout, or did you come in here looking for work? I've got no time to deal with the former, so I hope you plan on rolling up your sleeves. Sure, I'll give it a try. What do you need me to do? I'm glad to hear it. I'm so behind just now that I would welcome anyone's help, even from a human refugee. The king has decided to throw a party with his usual two-hour notice. Get over to the counter and start kneading that dough. Let's see if you can handle that task before we move you on to anything more complicated. You edge over to the counter, pick up the lump of dough, and half-heartedly begin to net it. While you're doing this, the cook resumes her flurry of activity, continuing the conversation with the other woman as if there had been no interruption. She hurries about the room, tending to several tasks at once. At the same time, she not only manages to keep up her end of the running conversation, but the serving girl's side as well. I'm worried about the children. I don't have a problem with them playing together, but the royal prince has begun to join in. There are human children in that group. You watch, nothing good can come of that. No offense, you understand. It's alright, I'm not quite human. Anyway, I've saved the worst for last. There's a human adult out there. He's talking with the children. Putting all sorts of ideas in their heads. Ideas about all of the races living together, treating each other as equals. Can you believe it? Rumor has it that he's a wizard. A child described some of his spells and they're like nothing we've ever seen. In fact, the spells weren't even similar to any of those cast by the humans. Either this human is the most powerful to come along, or he's a member of a different race entirely. Wouldn't that be exciting? Ooh, maybe a sartan? Maybe the child was exaggerating. You know how imaginative they can be. Of course, that's true. Those children can come up with some wild ideas. Still, it would have been exciting. 
You notice that the small elf child on the floor has been watching you with wide eyes and an unreadable expression. After a moment, she returns to playing with the battered, pathetic doll. She holds the doll above the floor and tries to make it walk around, but the fact that the doll is missing its head and the leg seem to make the experience less enjoyable than it should be. After a few moments, she drops the doll on the floor and sighs dejectedly. Okay, I have an idea about what to do here, but uh, that'll have to wait until next time. For now, thank you guys for watching, hope you enjoyed some more Death Gate, and as usual, don't miss the next episodes, because I won't. I will see you all next time.